Look at those skies. And just look at these amazing buildings. I just can't get enough of uh, these narrow laneways in Yangon. Not a cloud in the sky, not a hint of rain. Passing by another one of these just interesting little housing units with the balconies. I mean, if I could dream, I would dream of having a little apartment like that with a balcony. If I had one of those, I mean, you would never get me off it. I would have a chair out there with a little table, a book to read, a cup of coffee. Every afternoon I'd be out there enjoying the fresh air and reading my book. You'd never get me off that balcony. And all these places in uh, Yangon, as far as I can see, they all have these amazing uh, street side balconies. And if not balconies, these big shuttered windows that you can open. It's an incredible city. And even these uh, modern uh, new buildings here, a little bit more modern, even these have uh, open balconies all up the front there. Of course, they often end up being just uh, laundry stations for a lot of families. But for a single guy like me, that would be my uh, drinking coffee and reading uh, the latest Graham Greene spot. This is a very busy market area all around here. A lot of electronics, household goods, food, everything you can imagine. Clocks of all kinds. Watches, calculators, more electronics. Okay, time to stop messing around and head straight to the museum. I think I'm kind of walking in the direction of uh, Shwedagon Pagoda. It's the general direction I'm heading in. And along this road, I should pass by a train station. I think it's one of the stations that the uh, circular train stops at. And then I come to a fork in the road, turn left on the fork, and then start working my way zigzagging over to the uh, museum. When I was uh, looking at the kettle, a, a local man stopped, spoke English very well, and he wanted to help me with my purchase. So he was interpreting and translating for me between you know me and the uh, shopkeepers. And uh, I was just gonna buy the kettle and go testing a uh, you know, an inexpensive product like that hardly seems worth it. But he insisted that they plug it in and show me that there is an electric uh, connection, that it does work. I was a bit worried about that because you're not supposed to uh, plug these things in without water in them, you know? That's how they blow up. But they just plugged it in real quickly. The light on the front turned on, which meant that something is working. And then they unplugged it, plugged it in again, light came on, unplugged it. So, as far as they're aware, it works. We'll see how well it works actually uh, boiling water. Wow, here's a site. A church. Look at that. Beautiful church tower. I was reading an article this morning about a tour that you can take around various religious sites in Yangon and it struck me as kind of amusing because it listed all the places of worship you could go to and said you know so many dozens of pagodas you know maybe a dozen mosques three or four churches and then it said even a synagogue you know like one synagogue is like even a synagogue 
Like it was some sort of an extraordinary thing to have one. Plus one Armenian church. But I don't think there are very many uh, Christian churches in Yangon. In fact, I'm going to look on my map and find the uh, name of this one right now. With the power of the internet at my uh, fingertips here. Oops. I found out that this is the Holy Trinity Anglican Cathedral. It was designed by Robert Chisholm, a Madras-based architect, and uh, construction began in 1886, and it was completed in 1894, so it's well over a, a century old. And according to Wikipedia, the original organ was destroyed during World War II, and it was replaced with an uh, electric organ. Yeah, it's got a very nice setting here with the uh, open skyline all around it. I think we're right beside the well-known tourist market. It's just over there. Um, boy, this is going to be a struggle for me. Bogyoke tourism market, kind of like a souvenir market. It's just uh, heading in that direction. And the main train station is over there. I have to wonder what is wrong with the uh, marketing, the tourism marketing for Canada. Every conversation I have with uh, people anywhere in the world, they ask, where are you from? I say Canada, and they say, oh, Canada, so cold. That's our image abroad, you know, so nobody comes to visit because they think they'll uh, freeze to death when they get there. And I have to explain that, yeah, January, February, pretty chilly, but in the summertime, very warm, very pleasant. I have to explain about the uh, four seasons all the time. So Canadian tourism people, get on that. People around the world don't know that we have summer. Teach them. There's a nice view of the front of the cathedral. Like a large circular window there. Very nice. Kind of looks like a building that could have been transplanted from my area of Canada, you know, could easily have been, you know, somewhere in southern Ontario. Could easily see that church in a small town in southern Ontario. A funny thing I've noticed in my encounters with people, like with helpful people in other countries in general, they're being nice and they're being friendly. But in the conversation, it almost always ends up feeling like they're uh, telling you everything that you're doing wrong. You know? <laughs> so, so I was speaking with that man who was helping me buy the kettle. And he said, well, why are you here now? You should come back in December and January when it's cooler. You know, being here now is a terrible idea. So right away, I came to Myanmar at the wrong time of year. And he says, why are you in Yangon? You should go to Bagan. You should go here. You should go there. <laughs> and he's suggesting all of these more interesting places I can visit than where I am now. You know, that always happens. He's trying to be helpful. But in the end, he's just basically telling me that, oh man, you're in the wrong place too, buddy. I'm here in the wrong time of year. I'm visiting the wrong place. I'm doing the wrong things. I'm staying in the wrong hotel. He asked me why I wanted to buy a kettle. And I said, well, I'd like to you know, make a cup of coffee in my room. And he's like, why do you do that? You know, that's a really dumb thing to do. You know, in the hotel, cannot, can't they make coffee for you, right? <laughs> so in his attempts to help me and make my life better, he basically just tells me all the things I'm doing wrong in my life. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, when I, I wake up early in the morning and uh, the whatever restaurant is available usually isn't open when I wake up. And I would have gone on to explain that even if it was open, it's just so much trouble to go down, find someone, wait 20 minutes for the coffee or for them to boil the water. You know, it's just a huge complication. So I just like to be able to plug in my own kettle, bam, have a cup of coffee first thing in the morning. <laughs> and the one thing that older man picked up from that story was how I wake up early, so early that the restaurants aren't even open yet. And he's like, he was very proud of me for that. He says like, young people today, they don't know what it means to wake up early. They all play video games all night and they sleep late in the morning. They are so lazy. But our generation, you know, we know how life should be lived. We wake up early, get to work. So 
He did approve of that part of my lifestyle. That I got right. I've entered a different part of Yangon. Much wider streets, a lot of traffic. Not, uh, I'm outside of all the busy market lanes now. But one great thing about this street, I mean, look at this huge sidewalk. It's amazing. It has all these trees here providing some nice shade. So it's very comfortable walking along this road. Another little apartment building on the side. And a young woman in the window there feeding leftover rice to the pigeons. There must be something symbolically valuable here in the culture about feeding pigeons, because they do it a lot around Sule Pagoda on most of the intersections. Um, you see women sitting at the side of the road with piles of corn and they put the corn on little plates and then people buy the corn for a, you know, a few chat and then they throw it to the pigeons and the pigeons all come and eat, eat the corn. And I guess they gain some kind of merit for doing that. But I don't know why pigeons would be considered uh, you know, symbolic and, and, and giving you this benefit to your life, giving you good karma kind of thing. This is an older water station, more traditional, has the uh, drinking water inside these uh, clay pots. Yeah, that one is full, half full. And I have this vague idea that clay pots keep water cool, you know? I may be wrong about that, but I have that feeling. I always think of cool, fresh water coming out of a clay pot like that. I'm not sure who maintains this site. You know, that's a very good question. Um, someone has to come here with buckets of water and fill these up. Perhaps this sign uh, explains it all but I can't uh, read the sign, of course. It's probably done by a uh, Buddhist monks from one of these uh, nearby pagodas. The things you stumble across walking around. The Myanmar Table Tennis Federation. Seems to be connected in some way to this. There's a big hotel here called the Olympic Hotel. And there's kind of a swimming pool there. I imagine this is some kind of a sporting club. Oh yeah, much uh, larger uh, swimming pool over there. Mm. This morning I was reading about the Strand Hotel here in Yangon. The Strand, of course, is one of the most famous hotels in the world, a luxury hotel. You know, a lot of famous people stayed there over the years. George Orwell, Somerset Maugham, um, you know, all these famous writers. Rudyard Kipling, I believe, stayed there. And it has quite a history. And at one point, it had to be uh, renovated. It was getting out of date and it hadn't been kept up. And it was used during World War II to house uh, Japanese soldiers and officers. So things were not in the best of shape. But then a new company bought it and they renovated the whole place top to bottom. But apparently they were, did it in such a way that they kept all of the original style and architecture features and, and contents. So all the teak, mahogany, marble, um, everything like that, they just uh, kept it all. And they did such a good job with that that they were awarded a plaque by the Yangon Heritage Trust, which is a local organization dedicated to preserving colonial buildings and historic buildings in uh, Yangon. But because they stuck so carefully to their roots, 
they did not add modern features like a swimming pool or a gym, things like that. So in the high season, you could be paying as much as $500 a night for a room there. Um, each room comes with an individual butler, I read. In the off season, I think right now it's still considered somewhat the off season. It's about $300, $350 a night. And uh, you pay all that money and you still don't even get a swimming pool. But apparently you do get a very luxurious setting. And as I said, you get your own butler. I was reading about the Strand because one of my ideas for today was to go there and uh, pop inside, look around and perhaps have a cup of coffee in their cafe or restaurant. But the more I read about the place, the more I realized I had no business going in there. And they have some limited dress codes. And I read, said, I read something about how they can supply a jacket for men that don't have a jacket. So I <laughs> started to realize that it's not the kind of place for someone like me in my uh, t-shirt, shorts, and sandals, and uh, sweaty face to just pop in and uh, make myself at home amongst the people spending $500 a night, you know? <laughs> Who knows whether they would even let me in? I mean, if I did go there, I'd probably make sure to wear long pants, but uh, even at my best, I'm not going to be dressed to the levels expected by the Strand, I'm sure. I've reached an intersection where I'm expected to turn left. I've got about one kilometer to get to the National Museum. It's been a very nice walk. All these overhanging trees providing the shade. Very pleasant. Oh, getting closer. It's a little bit confusing at this point where the museum is. The address lists it as uh, over there on a main road. But when you follow the Google map directions to get to the building itself, they direct you down here, about uh, half a kilometer. So I'm gonna check out this side first. I wonder if this is the wall for the museum grounds. Could be, because I understand that they do have some very valuable items in there. Oh, apparently not. That is the Indian Embassy residential compound. And perhaps that's why it's so heavily fortified. And up ahead, there's quite a tower. It almost has a look of a prison. And a lot of the police trucks there as well. So this could be a prison up there too. So where is my museum? It should be right here. But it isn't. So maybe it really is uh, over on the other side on that uh, busy road. So Google Maps led me astray again, apparently. Said the entrance to the museum was there on that street, but that was a, the Indian Embassy and a police station. And I think I have to go over to the main street over here, Pia, Pia Street, something like that turn left and then the museum should be down that way I think. One odd thing about Google Maps, I remember looking at Google Maps for Myanmar or for Yangon in particular a years ago and I think I was able to go down to Street View and then you know look around at the buildings on Street View but on my last trip here and on this trip I'm, I, I can't do that no matter what I do you know, on my computer, I can't actually go down into Street View anymore. It just doesn't work. So I'm not sure if anything changed. Oh, we're going by the uh, Embassy of France. It was probably not the best place to have a camera running. Whew. Also located here is the uh, Embassy of Indonesia. Oh, so if you needed a, a visa for Indonesia, I guess this is where you uh, come. Though I haven't heard any stories um, from other people or read any online about whether they're actually issuing tourist visas here at this embassy or not. Certain embassies do, some don't, you know, it's just hard to say. All right, 
busy street. Oh, <laughs> check out the size of the uh, sign for the Embassy of Indonesia. They're not messing around. Anyway, here's the main busy street I was talking about. There's a bus, YBS 21. On my way back from the museum, I'm thinking maybe I'll hop on one of these buses. It's such a main street, you can get on a bus over there, I'm sure, and it'll take you, you know, back downtown. Somewhere, anyway. And I'm hoping the museum is uh, up here on the left. We will find out. I'm leaving from the National Museum. You can see the building behind me there. I had a, quite a nice lunch, a chicken uh, burger plus uh, tea leaf rice at the Yangon Cafe there. Mm, very tasty, very comfortable place, air conditioned inside, very quiet, almost too quiet. Inside the uh, cafe, there was just me and one other guy who was sitting there uh, working on something. He had a MacBook Air and then some kind of a tablet. I think he was busy translating or something. Oh, there's no music playing, no shouting, nothing at all. So I didn't really talk into the camera that much because uh, I didn't want to disturb the fellow who was working. Such a contrast to the other restaurants uh, I've been in. <clears throat> so I thought about taking a bus, but I'm gonna start off uh, walking. Go back by a different route, maybe see some new things in a uh, different neighborhood. I looked at the map a little bit and I'll be passing by a hospital, a nursing school, and I'll be passing by a hotel that I've been curious about called the SAT Hotel, SAT. I've nearly stayed there a few times uh, in my uh, previous visit because they had some, you know, adequate looking rooms at a very good price. So I wanna see what it looks like from the outside. This is the name of the main road, by the way, where the museum is located. PA, PA Road, something like that. And it's quite a large street, six or seven lanes across. This, this area seems to be something of an embassy district. And this is what I was talking about earlier. I thought I'd be going by one of the train stations on the uh, circular train. And here it is here, the Piai Road Station. And they have a, a ticket office here. And this is the, uh, the map of the uh, circular route. So I guess we are right here at Piai Road. And there's the uh, central station. And when I took it last time, I think I only went from here up to Insane and then got off the train there and came back again. Because at that time, as far as I understood it, the train didn't go all the way around in a circle. It only went part way and came back because of construction or something. Yangon Circular and Suburban Station Map. So you can hop on the train at any one of these stations, and then your ticket gets you all the way around. You can get off at any, any station you want, get back on again on the same ticket, and just spend hours exploring the whole area. So it's kind of an interesting thing to do. Oh, and there's two different directions. I guess that platform is too insane, this platform back to Yangon, but this is blocked off for some reason. Again, uh, who knows? There's always uh, some little wrinkle that you have to figure out. <laughs> So there's the, uh, the train tracks down there. And there goes the uh, circular train. Heading to uh, Yangon Station. It's funny how something like that, you know, just riding on a local commuter train has become a tourist attraction, but it really has. 
I knew about it even before I came to Myanmar. I did it. The two uh, women from the Netherlands that I was uh, having uh, my enjoyable breakfast with the last couple of days and chatting with, they also went out on the uh, circular train. And <laughs> when they reported back, though, they kind of gave it a, eh, you know, sort of rating. I think you can end up on an old traditional train that's quite interesting or you might end up with a, a newer, more modern train, and then you feel like you're just riding on the train around the city. It doesn't have that cultural experience feeling to it. So I think your, your mileage may vary when you take the circular train. You might have a great experience, or you might have just a kind of ordinary one. But as I said, you can also use it as a way just to explore the city, you know. Every time you go by an interesting looking uh, station, you just hop off the train, go look around, grab a snack or something, then hop back on the train again and uh, keep going. Slowly but surely making my way back to uh, Sule Pagoda and my guest house. And I think this guy is a uh, recycler. He's just calling out for anything people want to get rid of. He's got an old fan there that he's got. It's funny that today I finally got super organized in order to get out and, and get about my day before the rains hit. And uh, today, of course, is the day that it never did actually rain. It looked like it was going to <clears throat> when I was at the uh, museum. Some really dark rain clouds moved in, but it never seemed to rain. They just kind of went away and we're back to uh, blue skies again. Well, I've come full circle. I'm right back at the uh, Singapore Food Junction. One thing I just noticed is in the building across the street, way up at the top, there's the 888 KTV and Skyway Bar. I wonder if that place is actually open. Get a nice, perhaps a nice view of this part of the city from up there. So I'm almost back at my uh, guest house. There's a Sule Pagoda right there. And my uh, guest house is just down one of these side streets. Uh, I have to say that was, I've really enjoyed today. It turned out to be a really great day. Starting off by uh, stumbling across this market area here and then going inside all these buildings. That was really quite interesting. And the National Museum, I thought, was well worth the effort of going to uh, check it out especially since they had that Yangon Cafe there. To me, that always helps a lot. You've got the museum experience, and then you can sit down in some comfort and have a cold drink and kind of let the experience settle. I uh, really, uh, really like that. And then coming back again, stopping off at the uh, Sat Hotel, taking a look uh, inside. Oh, one thing the manager there told me is that there's a big holiday coming up. I swear I did my research. I looked for holidays in this month in Myanmar, and I guess I didn't really come up with anything. But my research must have been pretty uh, faulty because there's a big holiday coming up on, I'm not sure of the dates, but I think she said the 13th and the 14th. And it's the type of holiday where everybody goes home to their families, kind of like uh, Christmas, she said. It's a sort of a maybe a harvest festival, full moon festival, involves lanterns, all this kind of thing. Very similar, I guess, to lantern festivals in Taiwan and places like that. Anyway, as far as it relates to me, she was saying, well, if you're taking a train or a bus anywhere or over the next few days, you better get on that because everything's going to be booked if you uh, leave it too long because everybody's going to be go going home for this uh, holiday. So that was... Uh, <laughs> That was good information to get. So uh, tomorrow morning, I think I'll head to the train station and book a train to Mualamin, Mualamine. I'll have to learn how to say the name of that uh, city. So from up here on the uh, pedestrian bridge near uh, Sule Pagoda, I think that's the end of my day here in uh, Yangon, at least my, the end of my day as far as this video is concerned. 
I'm really looking forward to being back in my room, plugging in my brand new little kettle. I almost forgot about that adventure today. My electronic cup, I think it's called. I'm going to plug it in, see if it explodes or whether it actually heats up coffee for me. But I only have that experience left for today and I will see you in the next video. funny that these uh, pedestrian crossings, they seem to have developed into a little bit of a hotbed for the illicit. Every time I go up the stairs and then cross over to the other side, some young man comes sidling up to me with a whisper and he's offering me all kinds of illegal things and I have to tell him, uh, no thank you, no thank you, that's, uh, that's not my style, you know. <laughs> and they eventually get the message that I'm a very wholesome individual and uh, they leave me alone. But every time I cross uh, over that bridge, the same young men approach me with the same offers, you know, again and again. And you can, uh, uh, you can guess what they're offering me for the most part. Nice little epilogue to my day here in uh, Yangon. Now with the drumming, you are getting a lot of people in the uh, balconies. Coming out to see what's going on. This isn't in my alleyway for my guest house. I just heard the drumming, so I decided to walk down this alleyway to see what was going on.